There you go, that's a, my 15 minute intro. But for the person you've all come here to see, obviously, why don't we bring on stage Dame Laura Kenny. Laura, how are you doing? Your, um, is your, mic, your mic's all, is it, you're ready to I'm go. I'm assuming it's working. Am I working? Am I on? Can you hear all right at the back? How, how's the fitness at the moment? Um, you're saying you're doing a bit of running as well. Yeah, That's yeah, kind of I have, tough. yeah, I've started running. I mean, I call it, so like with Albie, I said I was exercising. Because you get caught in this funny, I don't want to promote, like, you know, when you're pregnant and saying that it's safe for everyone, because it's really like how, what you've done before mm. um, is what is deemed safe. And obviously, I was at a high level before, so for me, going out for three, four hours is what I was doing anyways. Mm. Um, but just this time, it has felt really different in terms of, obviously, with everything that's happened pre-falling pregnant this time, it just, I feel really vulnerable, <clears throat> and it just feels a lot scarier. And like, I obviously promote going out on the road, you know, I love going out, fresh air, riding my bike, but for me, just at the minute... I haven't quite got past the point where I feel completely okay with this mm. pregnancy. So I've just been in the garage um, or running, like you say, because running has been my way of getting out of the house rather than just using the gym at home. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to do my first 10K out on Sunday. Are you? Yeah. I mean, uh, if, I want to go under an hour. I mean, really, I want to do, like, 56 minutes, but I'll say under an hour just in case I don't make it. There's, and also, in uh, about four weeks' time, there's a, there's a Welsh pool 10K. You could come down and do that. Well, so. maybe, yeah. Well, let me see yeah. if I actually survive this one. <laughs> <laughs> but it's great. I and mean, obviously, you know, because I can only imagine it, you know, but um, as an Olympian, you must be, you know, you, you've, got to, you've got to try and keep that element of fitness. And obviously, it helps with the pregnancy, right? The fitter you are and so on and so forth. But have you got a kind of, like, are you just taking it? week by week as it were yeah yeah i mean to be honest day by day um it's just so different it's just, just honestly i mean with albie being there as well obviously this has been different and he, if he doesn't sleep very well or if jason's been away and i'm sole parent then it's just really different to how tired i am to what i can actually do that day um because obviously jason's now the british cycling coach so he's away currently at the europeans and like last night albie didn't sleep very well like he was in our bed and it was just a nightmare. So when I woke up this morning, I was just like, oh, like when he goes to school, I am going back to bed <laughs> because yeah. that's, just, that's yeah. just how it is. Whereas yeah. really, I set my heart on doing three hours. So it's just like a fine balance of... Three hours of sleeping instead of three hours of... Basically, life. yeah. 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 <laughs> you just got to take it one day at a time, as you say. Exactly. Um, but it's fantastic news and um, oh, really, really chuffed for you. Uh, I, I definitely don't think I've interviewed a Dane before. Um, I've interviewed a couple of sirs, but definitely not a dame. Um, really big honour for me. I mean, do you insist on when you're down the supermarket and places like that? Do you know? Do you, do you kind of say, excuse me, person on the checkout, I mean, I it's Dame Laura Kenny. I didn't see your bow when I got onto the stage. Yeah, stage. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> no, not at all. I mean, to be totally honest, when you get the email, I mean, back pre-COVID, it was a letter through the post, but now it's an email mm. um, when you're getting on it. It just feels so surreal and like so far away from what Jason and I are and are about that it's just, it just doesn't, it almost doesn't feel right. Like, I don't know, it's, it's like a funny, yeah, I don't know. It's obviously nice to have, yeah. but it just doesn't seem like us. And because you're married to a knight, you're also a lady? Yeah, so I got to choose actually. Did um, you? Yeah, so they rang us. Well, I mean, to be honest, I actually missed the first phone call and then I got a really demanded phone call saying, you've not replied. <laughs> and I was just like, oh, well, I didn't know how to reply. <laughs> But, so yeah, so I could either have been Lady Kenny or Dame Laura. If I'd been Lady Laura, I'd have taken it. But, yeah. but why have I got to drop my name? Lady Laura, I mean, it sounds like you should have a pop career. Yeah, it sounds like I should have yeah. a crown. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I didn't like Lady Kenny, so no, I chose Dame Laura instead. Yeah, I think so, and it kind of puts you on that level field, doesn't it, with, J with Jason as well, that kind of like... Yeah, you know, well, I don't know, yeah, it feels yeah. like my achievement. <laughs> exactly, I suppose then, so for people getting onto cycling, um, people who might not have been onto Wikipedia or have been under a rock for the last few years and not seen the, uh, the media and all the rest of it, the uh, greatest ever female Olympian, bar none, six Olympic medals, five of them gold, having won both the Team Pursuit and the Omnium at, at uh, 2012 and 2016 Olympics, and the Madison at 2020, 
along with a silver medal from the team pursuit at the 2020 Olympics, you are both the most successful female cyclist and the most successful British, British female athlete in Olympic history. Um, in total, you've won, this might have gone up by now, I don't know, 63 medals at UCI, UEC Europeans, UCI World Cups, Olympic, Commonwealth Games, 44 gold. So bananas. <laughs> and you're 30 years old. I mean, that deserves a round of applause, doesn't it, I think? <laughs> wow. That must, that's incredible. I think it's incredible. If you, how much you've packed into those 12 years. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's not just down to me and the bit that of I course. do. There's been so many people that have played a massive part in that. Um, I mean, it only sounds mad because you're reading them all in one go. <laughs> really, it was over quite a long period of time. Yeah, sure. Sort of 12 years or so, isn't it? Yeah. Since your, yeah. your first British senior um, title. Um, but down it back again, if we just kind of get, take it back a little bit, or right the way back, in fact. Um, one thing I didn't know, but before obviously doing some research, and um, when Alan discussed it, you know, he said that, you know, Dame Laura's coming, I was starting to look into it and went back into your family history. And obviously you were born in Harlow, but with a collapsed lung and diagnosed with asthma yeah. at birth, um, at a very early age. And you had to give up your first love, which was trampolining. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, obviously, as a parent now, I appreciate what my mum and my dad went through at the time. But um, yeah, so I was born premature, so I was four weeks early. Um, and I had a collapsed lung at the time. But just to know what my mum and dad had gone through, yeah, was actually quite, um, yeah, I don't know, like an eye-opener, I guess. Um, and I mean, I was, I was lucky enough that I could go back to that hospital because they redid it. And um, I actually opened it for them back in 2012. Wow. Yeah, like the, the unit, obviously, where I was when I was little. Um, but yeah, then that, obviously, that's why I ended up with asthma. Um, because I was, my mum and dad always used to say I breathed like a pig. Like, it sounded like a snorting noise constantly. And then they just, I was in and out of the GP for ages, like years. And then I was six when they said, I think you've got asthma, but they can't, I mean, I don't know what the rules are now, um, but at the time they couldn't diagnose you until you were eight. So I didn't actually find out until I was eight that I actually had asthma. Wow. Are you asthmatic now, by the way? Did that, so or? now it's sports induced, because they yeah. do say that you can grow out of it. Um, and so now I only ever use an inhaler, like for bike riding purposes, because like a velodrome, I don't know how many people have been in a velodrome, but it, it's so dusty because obviously there's, there's, the air is barely moving. Mm. Um, and so it's only in that setting that it gets me. Like, because obviously we're in tunnels and stuff warming up. Um, and so like, that's, all, that's when it gets set off. That's when it's at its worst. And you've got to, you've got to be careful, obviously, you know, with all the, um, the kind of doping regulations and all the rest of it. Um, presumably you've got to kind of you know, register all that beforehand, and it's got to be checked. They've got to check your pump and all the rest of it, have they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we're under, like, real strict. So every single day, I have to give her an hour a day where someone could just knock on my door and come and test That's me. That's the whereabouts, so, is that yeah. 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 So you're under, like, a really strict um, kind of, I don't know, guidelines, whatever, um, that we have to be under. But then, yeah, any medication that you take... So some things are fine. So, like, paracetamol, you can also just take, and that's fine. You just write on your form that you've taken paracetamol. But inhalers... And like anything, I guess, more than just your bog standard medication that you could buy at um, like a supermarket, you have to register and you just have to go through your doctor and he signs it off and then it goes off to the UCI and then that's it, then you can use it. Mm. It's interesting, isn't it? And it's, that's just one of those other things that you've just got to remember and obviously, you know, with the way the family situation and all the rest of it, you've got to remember, you know, are you going to be there if you're taking Albie to school and all this? It must be quite difficult to manage all of that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's complicated <laughs> and yeah. like Jason and I are absolute carnage um, <laughs> but and growing up in the household you know obviously your sister um, Emma who um, is your old elder sister um, you're running around together you're you know doing things you're getting into sport etc how did uh, how did you both get into cycling was that you know from, from a family point of view, or was it through other clubs? Um, I mean, it was through family. Well, it was through family and club, but my mum, basically, in year 2000, she just decided this was it. Like, she was going to start losing weight, um, and she chose cycling and spin classes, like, as a way of doing that. She lost eight and a half stone in a year and a half. Wow. So it wasn't just like, a, oh, I'm just going to do this, you know what I mean? And it was like a whole lifestyle change. It wasn't just riding a bike that got her there. 
but she didn't exercise at all before riding a bike. Um, and then that was it. Like, so I was eight. And it just became such a massive part of our life. Um, and like my dad was the typical like Monday to Friday at work dad. The only time we'd really get to see him was at the weekends. And so that became the family go-to. Like, so every weekend we would go out and ride our bikes. Um, and then one thing led to another. It started off just as like a mountain bike down in Lee Valley, because obviously I grew up down south, to then going around the country, traveling to races here, there, everywhere. Uh, and then obviously Emma progressed faster than me. Like she went through the squads because she is two and a half years older than me. Um, and so she started going off like on the British cycling because British cycling works like a scouting system, like it does in like say football. Um, so she got onto like the first squad, and then she kind of moved away to the point where my dad had to start taking her to races, and my mum would take me because obviously she was t she was almost turning professional before mm. I was. Um, and then once I became of the age. Then we started travelling around together then, and we started doing it together again. Yeah. Uh, did you learn a lot from him? Because she was ju national junior road race champ, yeah. right? Um, she was riding for Dolman's Bowls as well, um, Continental. Um, was, it, was that a, a, a big help to you, having Emma there? Oh, definitely, yeah. It's like second sibling syndrome, isn't it? Like, the, the second one is always better. Like, it's just... <laughs> it's just like, she's not here, she's um, not. So when I was 15, I decided I'm going to be a track sprinter. I mean, why I decided to sprint, I mean, physique-wise, you'd think, <laughs> no, I'm not sure about that. But I really enjoyed the sprint program. Um, and 15, they put me on, like, British Cycling put me on to the junior sprint squad. And then that was it, really. I think from that point onwards, I thought, mm, no, like, I think this is a career. Um, and, like, UK Sport do start funding you at that level as yeah, well. So yeah. I'd already started to see how it could fund a career. Um, and then that was it, to be honest. Like, I just never looked back. I just, I was a product of British Psych and I just went through the system. But as you'd expect, you know, given your success, you know, at such an early stage, your first track championship or European title um, was 18 in the team pursuit. Um, what do you remember of that first, first big medal, as it were? Um, I don't really remember much. Everything seemed at the time like such a whirlwind because I'd moved to Manchester, so I'd, obviously that was the first time moving away from home. Yeah. And my mum and dad couldn't come with me at the time. Well, because I mean, they were both working, so it was difficult. Um, and I remember I had a little mini, and they loaded up my mini and kind of sent me on my way. And the set of, so British Cycling can give you a flat that you, that you, like, you don't have to pay rent for. The, for the first couple of years, they give you a flat, they give you a place to stay. And I remember moving into this flat just like, what? am I going to do? Like, I obviously, I had no idea. My mum just literally looked after us to the day that I left. Even so much as stupid things like turning the washing machine on. Like, I'd never turned a washing machine on. I do not. <laughs> no. Wow. I mean, there's some bad stories about <laughs> what happened. I mean, I set fire... Okay, right, I've set fire... Here we go. I've set fire to a few things <laughs> in the past. <laughs> but the two worst things was I set fire... And it wasn't actually my fault, I'm going to say, okay? I set fire to a jacket potato... <laughs> In the oven. But At least it's in the oven. Yeah, oh, yeah, but that happened because the people before me just left fat in the... I didn't think to take the tray out, so yeah. that set fire. And then I set fire, I blew a microwave up. Did you? By a complete accident. <laughs> with a sweet potato, because I misread the instructions. She told Instructions me, on a sweet potato? Like, it was from my nutritionist. She okay. just gave ah, me right. a recipe. Yeah. And she said, <laughs> five minutes each side. And I stuck it in for ten minutes. Just, and it set on fire. Seems logical. And you don't need tin foil on it to set it on fire. <laughs> <laughs> or blow the microwave door off. <laughs> Let's go straight into 2012. Yeah. Now, Ed Clancy's been here, Alice has been here, and they just said it was literally just the most incredible, bonkers whirlwind in the UK, in a tumble dryer yeah. of a year. How was it for you? I mean, yeah, the same, to be honest. I mean, everything for me happened so fast. So I was junior world champion in 2010. They asked me to go to the Worlds in 2011, and we go on to win. And at the time, I'd never even thought about the Olympics. I was part of this program that my council ran, where they had 20 12-year-olds, like, I don't know, like, raise these flags or whatever for each borough that the Olympics was going to have an effect on. Because obviously I grew up like, only half an hour away from that velodrome. And... Obviously, at the time, you're thinking, well, none of these kids are probably going to make it to the Olympics. Like, it, it, it was insane. And it had never, it never crossed my mind that 2012 was going to be the Olympics I go to. It was always 2016 was the target. 
And then when we won in 2011, obviously the team pursuit was the Olympic event. And it was from that point that I thought, hang on a minute, like I'm on some sort of false track. And I could feel it within British cycling. Like they were putting me in, like we had a um, like an aer whole aerodynamics team that um, you have to go and have meetings with and skin suit fittings and everything's done to like the T, you know, like it is, I mean, we talk about marginal gains. I cannot even explain to you how in depth they went for that Olympics. And all of a sudden I'm like getting pulled from pillar to post because I'm in all these meetings that before that 2011 win I wasn't in. And I was just like, wow, like they actually genuinely think I'm going to go to the Olympics here. And so when obviously it happened and you get the letter saying like you're going to the Olympics, I, I honestly couldn't believe it because it is a dream come true. Like I was that kid that was like, I want to be Olympic champion at school. And everyone was like, what's that? And, and like I was that kid that was constantly like, sport is my thing. So it was just a dream that just happened. And for, it to, for my first one to be at home, I, like, I couldn't have wished for anything more. You, um, talk us through, obviously you've got there, you've got to the velodrome, you've got to the Olympics. What is it like when you arrive there and however many billion people are watching this feed, yeah. you're sat on your bike, you're on the boards, you're about to go. Well, we do it every single day. It, uh, it didn't Simple actually, as that. Yeah, yeah. It felt like nothing else. And the only thing, like, I remember before the 500, so obviously in the Omnium. So the Omnium, for those that don't know, it's over two, it was over two days, six events. And at the time, it all tallied up. So you got one point for a win, two, three, all the way down. And when you got to the 500 meter, which was the last event, which at the time as well was my best event, I needed to... So Sarah Hammer, the American girl, was winning by four points. So I needed to win the 500 and she needed to come fourth. And I just never felt anything. Like, I honestly sat on the bike and I was like, I'm going to win. And, like, you don't get it very often where you are that confident that you almost know the outcome. For the, ch the chances of her coming fourth were, like, slim to none. She'd finished second to me in the 500 time and time again that year. But I don't know, I just kind of, I had this sense of it's going to happen. And I remember it felt like forever, because obviously when you cross the finish line, your little number comes up and it came up one. And I was thinking, well, that's one job done. And then I was just waiting like, oh, and then it came up four. And I just remember thinking, I can't believe this. Like, I can't believe this has actually happened to me. It's absolutely incredible, isn't it? And I mean, what's it like once you've, you know, you achieve that? And what's it like standing on the podium? Because... For every single person in this room, there's no Olympic champions here, though. No. <laughs> you know, none of us can even think what that's like. Um, I don't know. That one was different, like, at, the, at London 2012. And the Omnium was really different because it was a shock. Like, I never thought... Yeah. I never went into that day thinking, oh, this is my title. The Team Pursue, we'd broken the world record six times up yeah. until that event. So th there was part of me that was like, as long as it comes together, it will happen. But standing up there, yeah, I don't know, on your own, in the place where you feel like you've grown up was just something else. And I remember looking up and seeing so many people that I had, like family members, um, and it was my best friend's birthday as well, in the crowd. Like, it was just a feeling like no other. It's incredible. You're in London, you're double Olympic champion, you're 20 years old. Unbelievable. Yeah, well, I mean, it changed my life. Like, yeah. it generally did change my life. From that point onwards, like, I couldn't just go and ride my bike anymore. Like, I became... A, a different, like, a role model. Oh, and, like, I guess I got thrown into it because I never expected that to happen. Nobody knew me before. No, no, exactly. But following 2012, uh, I did just want to delve into a little bit because, you know, people know you as a track cyclist, really, and, you, you know, as, as a, a track Olympian. But you also, you were quite successful on the roads. So post-2012, um, in fact, very successful, you know, you became, you were national road race champion. GB, you rode for a Wiggle Honda. Um, and, you know, sometimes you hear about track cyclists who've gone onto the road or vice versa, and they, they say they're doing it to complement their racing, but you actually really did get stuck in at road racing. Oh, I mean, I wouldn't go that far. I, I'm, I'm well, tried. to be na national champion, it's pretty... Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah. the national, that was a fluke more than anything, I think, <laughs> to be totally honest. I, I got seriously lucky. So in that race, right... In fact, it wasn't too far from here somewhere. Oh, it's Abergavenny. Oh, was it Abergavenny? Yeah. Get the oh. AA map out again. It's, <laughs> when it, it's we only about 100 we miles away, but anyway. <laughs> South Wales. Oh, South okay. Wales. Right, so Lizzie. So I don't know whether people know very much about the people involved, but basically Lizzie Dignan was Armistead at the time. Yeah. Attacks, right? 
And we're like 20k from the finish. And I thought, well, that's that done, job done. Except, look, for, so whatever reason, everyone was going back to her, like one by one, like they're chasing her down one by one. Well, I've had teammates in this race. So like Danny Rowe, Danny King at the time, just rides over to her and I'm like, oh, well, brilliant. This is me. I don't have to do nothing now. Because obviously, once your teammates in there, you're thinking, well, it's over to them now to try and win this bike race. Except Emma Pooley, who was known as pretty much our best time trialist at the time, mm. just drags me back to the, like, the leading bunch. And I was like, well, it's a bunch. Like, I'm definitely going to win a bunch sprint now. Like, it was just insane. And I literally just sat there. I didn't do anything. And then won the sprint at the finish. So I think it was a fluke <laughs> more than anything. A fluke. Just like Mark Cavendish's fluke 36 uh, <laughs> Tour de France. You obviously, you know, you've got to be there at the right time, in the right place to yeah. take the title. Um, but would you say, you know, uh, would you say that, you know, you had a real... Like a real love for road racing at the time as well, or is it? No, no, not didn't? at all. No, like I've never loved it at all, to okay. be honest. I just think, like, you're putting your career into so many people's hands. Like, in a road race, there's 200 odd riders. Like, if you go and you ride the, well, I'm not even sure what you call them, but the World Cup, say, on the road, there's 200 other females there, and your race can be determined by whether one of them basically crashes you and you fall off. It's just there's so many things that can happen in a road race that I just think there's too many variables. The track doesn't have that. You don't have brakes for starters, so no one can slam on in front of you and you randomly crash into them. Or even worse, someone can just randomly crash into the back of you and take you off. You don't have that in the track. And you only have 20 other riders to deal with. And it's warm and dry. <laughs> exactly, and yeah. there's not a hill in sight. <laughs> <laughs> There's a bit of banking that goes up. Yeah, 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 and some tracks are worse than others for that. Yeah, know? yeah. <laughs> and that must have been a really odd environment. You know, COVID was still on. I mean, honestly, still... like, the velodrome was better than it's ever been. I loved it because it, well, there was no public. It was just us. <laughs> and, and, like, they split. <laughs> I mean, you love I, the public, I really. I people. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's because the whole thing was ours. So each, when you walked in, you were in a pen. You were literally in a pen. Mm -hmm. So they, they had them like metal whatevers that they have at football matches and you were in one. Like, so not your team, literally you and your bike and that was it. And because when you go into the velodrome normally at British Cycling, you have to go down and you pick your bike up from mechanics and then you march up the stairs. And to be honest, it is a bit of a pain because like, you've got to get through all these double doors and you're trying to protect this really nice bike you've been given. Well, you just walked in, it was just there because they didn't want anyone near each other. You're a four-time Olympic champion, so it should be. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit as well, just finally as well, about women in cycling. We're talking about women in cycling, obviously, tonight as well. Um, there's a real buzz around women's pro cycling at the moment. Anyone who follows cycling in, in, in the Continental and the World Tour, you know, the women's Tour de France Femme last year was amazing. Um, there's more money coming into the women's sport, which mm -hmm. is long overdue. I'm sure that you'd agree. Um, how important is that to you, seeing young females, women getting into cycling, and also, you know, getting, getting that, for want of a better word, level playing field with the men's yeah. sport. Oh, like, massively important. Um, to me, I could never understand why we, we haven't been level. And obviously, I've been really lucky that track cycling is all deemed under UCI, so our prize money has always been the same. So, like, obviously, I could never take away from that. That's been brilliant. But the roadside, I mean, when I first started, was, like, beyond diabolical, really. Like, the, the amount of money people get... Well, my sister, I saw it, obviously, with my sister. And the amount of money you're getting asked to live off of, to give up literally your life to do it, it's just insane. But the step now that they've taken, obviously, is massive. Do I think there's still work to be done? Yes, of course. I think all pro teams should have a women's team. It should be written somewhere in a contract that... If you are running a men's team, you have to run a women's pro team too. Please, everybody, give a massive round of applause for Dame Laura Kenny. Thank you so much.